So I ended the last lecture talking about, remember, the U.S. government's the only state that dropped a nuclear bomb. And sometimes I've mentioned that and students almost feel like, oh my gosh, you're really attacking the U.S. by saying that. But I want to point out, since this is a world civilization class, that whether you feel that that's justified or whatever the case, it's not an irony lost on the rest of the world that the one nation that really polices, that leads the policing of nuclear proliferation in the world, is by the only nation that actually killed um, two cities' loads of civilians with nuclear bombs. So, I mean, that's what you've got to understand in perception. When Iranians are told they can't have a nuclear bomb, you think they don't notice and say, oh my gosh, America who dropped uh, bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki are telling us not to have nuclear bombs? So, of course they are. And you can, you can hear that like when you read their press or different nations. <coughs> again, oh, excuse me. Again, I'm not necessarily promoting one perspective or not, but it's good to just kind of take that in. You know, we went to war in Iraq based on the possibility they have, may have weapons of mass destruction. Do we still have nuclear bombs? Yes, we do. Again, these are things that people discuss in the world, ironies that are considered the world. For certain American nationalists, this only makes sense that... Um, some claim that we're the only ones morally capable of having one, but does that argument ring with you, or does it, do you, even more importantly, does it ring with the world? Does it matter what the world thinks? Not everybody cares. There's all these different aspects that you have to like remember that world historians try to be neutral, but depending on the nation state that you come from you know you're going to kind of like look more closely at certain perspectives is all i'm trying to say all right so um we're gonna move on here and then talk about occupation zones and i'm talking about occupation zones after world war ii we're talking about those conferences that were held so remember here's germany you see my arrow and the germans cut through and were invading and pounding um to death Russia and they cut through you know all these Eastern European nations Stalin helps lead the Soviet people into the army coming back through all the way up into East Germany this is how we get the east-west split and then he's able to actually occupy you know a huge section of Europe all of this was to set back um, the Nazis. <clears throat> Keep in mind that many Western nations were hoping that the Nazis would at least be able to knock off quite a bit of the Soviet Union. Maybe they were aware of that. Stalin now has military occupation of a huge section of Europe and a, a weakened economy, destroyed infrastructure, his country's in shambles, is he going to get natural resources or help from anybody in the West, non-communist uh, uh, countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, West Germany, France, the United States? No. So what's he going to do? Militarily occupy these and utilize their resources? What? So you can see the advantage it would take for the Soviet Union to keep control of these territories and so again we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more about that later but just kind of putting that into perspective so we had a divided Europe often called the Iron Curtain okay and Winston Churchill gave this famous Iron Curtain speech at a college in Missouri America <coughs> in 1946 he said the United States stands at the time uh, at this time, at the pinnacle of world power. It is a solemn moment for the American democracy, for with this primacy and power is also joined an awe-inspiring accountability in the future. And so then he goes on in the middle section, I'm just going to read, I have a strong admiration and regard for the valiant Russian people and for my wartime comrade, Marshal Stalin. Very odd. That's a pure political uh, diplomacy. Remember, at the time, it was officially not enemy yet with Stalin, but he was not a fan of him. It is my duty, however, to place before you certain facts about the present position in Europe. And then he then 
basically he's saying um, I, what I call the Soviet sphere, all these countries that are occupied by the Soviets are all subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to the very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. <coughs> so the, the United States and other European nations realized Nazism was destroyed. Italy's fascism Mussolini is hung. Hitler kills himself. Nazis are just, are, you know, whacked out. Japan, fascist Japan, gets nuclear bombs dropped. And, and more, to say the least. And then becomes military occupied. Who's left standing? Well, the United States is the lead in the Western non-communist world, the only really, you know, country that's looking good, shiny, and strong. And then you have the Soviet Union, who's beat up and tattered, but also has control of much of Europe. And so he's looking at this divided Europe and this what he calls the Iron Curtain of these two spheres, and he's seeing, in a sense, a kind of prophetic tension that's going to build. And this is very pivotal. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> so the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, these come up. You might have heard these before. The Truman Doctrine comes up in 1947 to support free peoples who resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. That's a poetic way of saying anybody that the Soviet Union supports um, we're against and for any people resisting Soviet interests we're against. Programmed by Secretary of um, State George Marshall, the Marshall Plan um, was to help aid uh, war-torn countries so that they would be able to get together and not be seduced by communism. Um, that was the, the fear. So the idea was to contain communism. That's the whole point. Okay? And so actually I'm going to end it there. I'm going to go back to that and I'll have some more lectures coming soon.